Section eight of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Vierick. Chapter fifteen. Thus three weeks passed without apparent change in their relations. Ernest possessed a personal magnetism that always emanating from him was felt most deeply when withdrawn. He was at all times involuntarily exerting his power, which she ever resisted, always on the alert, always warding off. When at last pressure of work made his immediate departure for New York imperative, he had not apparently gained the least ground. But Ethel knew in her heart that she was fascinated, if not in love. The personal fascination was supplemented by a motherly feeling toward Ernest, that, sensuous in an essence, was in itself not far removed from love. She struggled bravely and with external success against her emotions, never losing sight of the fact that twenty and thirty are fifty. Increasingly aware of her own weakness, she constantly attempted to lead the conversation into impersonal channels, speaking preferably of his work. "'Tell me,' she said, negligently fanning herself, "'what new inspiration have you drawn from your stay at the seaside?' "'Why,' he exclaimed enthusiastically, "'volumes and volumes of it! I shall write the great novel of my life after I am once more quietly installed at Riverside Drive.' "'The great American novel,' she rejoined. "'Perhaps.' "'Who will be your hero? Clark?' There was a slight touch of malice in her words, or rather in the pause between the penultimate word and the last. Ernest detected its presence, and knew that her love for Reginald was dead. Stiff and cold it lay in her heart's chamber, beside how many others, all emboxed in the coffin of memory. No, he replied after a while, a little piqued by her suggestion. Clark is not the hero. What makes you think that he casts a spell on everything I do? Dear child, she replied, I know him. He cannot fail to impress his powerful personality upon all with whom he comes in contact, to the injury of their intellectual independence. Moreover, he is so brilliant and says everything so much better than anybody else, that by his very splendor he discourages effort in others. At best his influence will shape your development according to the tenets of his mind, curious, subtle, and corrupted. You will become mentally distorted, like one of those hunchback Japanese trees, infinitely wrinkled and infinitely grotesque, whose laws of growth are not determined by nature, but by the diseased imagination of the East. "'I am no weakling,' Ernest asserted, "'and your picture of Clark is altogether out of perspective. His splendid successes are to me a source of constant inspiration. We have some things in common, but I realize that it is along entirely different lines that success will come to me. He has never sought to influence me. In fact, I never received the smallest suggestion from him." Here the Princess Marigold seemed to peer at him through the veil of the past, but he waved her aside. "'As for my story,' he continued, "'you need not go so far out of your way to find the leading character.' "'Who can it be?' Ethel remarked, with a merry twinkle. "'You?' "'Ethel,' he said sulkingly, "'be serious. You know that it is you.' "'I am immensely flattered,' she replied. "'Really, nothing pleases me better than to be immortalized in print, since I have little hope nowadays of perpetuating my name by virtue of pencil or brush. I have been put into novels before, and am consumed with curiosity to hear the plot of yours.' "'If you don't mind, I had rather not tell you just yet,' Ernest said. "'It's going to be called Leontina. That's you. But all depends on the treatment. You know it doesn't matter much what you say so long as you say it well. That's what counts. At any rate, any indication of the plot at this stage would be decidedly inadequate." "'I think you are right,' she ventured. "'By all means, choose your own time to tell me. Let's talk of something else. Have you written anything since your delightful book of verse last spring? Surely now is your singing season. By the time we are thirty the springs of pure lyric passion are usually exhausted." Ethel's inquiry somehow startled him. In truth he could find no satisfactory answer. A remark relative to his play, Clark's play, rose to the threshold of his lips, but he almost bit his tongue as soon as he realized that the strange delusion which had possessed him that night still dominated the undercurrents of his cerebration. No, he had accomplished but little during the last few months, at least by way of creative literature. So he replied that he had made money. "'That is something,' he said. "'Besides, who can turn out a masterpiece every week? 
An artist's brain is not a machine, and in the respite from creative work I have gathered strength for the future. But, he said, slightly annoyed, you are not listening. His exclamation brought her back from the train of thoughts that his words had suggested, for in his reasoning she had recognized the same arguments that she had hourly repeated to herself in defense of her inactivity when she was living under the baneful influence of Reginald Clark. Yes, baneful. For the first time she dared to confess it to herself. In a flash the truth dawned upon her that it was not her love alone, but something else, something irresistible and very mysterious that had dried up the well of creation in her. Could it be that the same power was now exerting its influence upon the struggling soul of this talented boy? Rack her brains as she might, she could not definitely formulate her apprehensions, and a troubled look came into her eyes. "'Ethel,' the boy repeated impatiently, "'why are you not listening? Do you realize that I must leave you in half an hour?' She looked at him with deep tenderness. Something like a tear lent a soft radiance to her large, childlike eyes. Ernest saw it and was profoundly moved. In that moment he loved her passionately. "'Foolish boy,' she said softly, then lowering her voice to a whisper, "'You may kiss me before you go.' His lips gently touched hers, but she took his head between her hands and pressed her mouth upon his in a long kiss. Ernest drew back a little awkwardly. He had not been kissed like this before. "'Poet though you are,' Ethel whispered, "'you have not yet learned to kiss.' She was deeply agitated when she noticed that his hand was fumbling for the watch in his vest pocket. She suddenly released him, and said, a little hurt, "'No, you must not miss your train. Go, by all means.' Vainly Ernest remonstrated with her. "'Go to him,' she said, and again, "'Go to him.' With a heavy heart the boy obeyed. He waved his hat to her once more from below, and then rapidly disappeared in the crowd. For a moment strange misgivings cramped her heart, and something within her called out to him, "'Do not go, do not return to that house.' But no sound issued from her lips. Worldly wisdom had sealed them, had stifled the inner voice. And soon the boy's golden head was swallowed up in the distance. CHAPTER Sixteen. While the train sped to New York, Ethel Brandenburg was the one object engaging Ernest's mind. He still felt the pressure of her lips upon his, and his nostrils dilated at the thought of the fragrance of her hair brushing against his forehead. But the moment his foot touched the ferry-boat that was to take him to Manhattan, the past three weeks were, for the time being at least, completely obliterated from his memory. All his other interests that he had suppressed in her company because she had no part in them came rushing back to him. He anticipated with delight his meeting with Reginald Clark. The personal attractiveness of the man had never seemed so powerful to Ernest as when he had not heard from him for some time. Reginald's letters were always brief. Professional writers, he was wont to say, cannot afford to put fine feeling into their private correspondence. They must turn it into copy. He longed to sit with the master in the studio when the last rays of the daylight were tremulously falling through the stained window, and to discuss far into the darkening night philosophies young and old. He longed for Reginald's voice, his little mannerisms, the very perfume of his rooms. There was also a deluge of letters likely to await him in his apartment, for in his hurried departure he had purposely left his friends in the dark as to his whereabouts. Only to Jack he had dropped a little note the day after his meeting with Ethel. He earnestly hoped to find Reginald at home, though it was well nigh ten o'clock in the evening, and he cursed the rapid transit for its inability to annihilate time and space. It is indeed disconcerting to think how many months, if not years, of our earthly sojourn the dwellers in cities spend in transportation conveyances that must be set down as a dead loss in the ledger of life. A nervous impatience against things material overcame Ernest in the subway. It is ever the mere stupid obstacle of matter that weighs down the wings of the soul and prevents it from soaring upward to the sun. When at last he had reached the house, he learned from the hall-boy that Clark had gone out. Ruffled in temper he entered his rooms and went over his mail. There were letters from editors with commissions that he could not afford to reject. Everywhere newspapers and magazines opened their yawning mouths to swallow up what time he had. He realized at once that he would have to postpone the writing of his novel for several weeks, if not longer. Among the letters was one from Jack. It bore the postmark of a little place in the Adirondacks where he was staying with his parents. Ernest opened the missive not without hesitation. 
on reading and re-reading it the fine lines on his forehead that would some day deepen into wrinkles became quite pronounced and a look of displeasure darkened his face something was wrong with jack a slight change that defied analysis their souls were out of tune it might only be a passing disturbance perhaps it was his own fault it pained him nevertheless somehow it seemed of late that jack was no longer able to follow the vagaries of his mind only one person in the world possessed a similar mental vision, only one seemed to understand what he said and what he left unsaid. Reginald Clark, being a man and poet, read in his soul as in an open book. Ethel might have understood, had not love, like a cloud, laid itself between her eyes and the page. It was with exultation that Ernest heard near midnight the click of Reginald's key in the door. He found him unchanged, completely, radiantly himself. Reginald possessed the psychic power of undressing the soul, of seeing it before him in primal nakedness. Although no word was said of Ethel Brandenburg except the mere mention of her presence in Atlantic City, Ernest intuitively knew that Reginald was aware of the transformation that absence had wrought in him. In the presence of this man he could be absolutely himself, without shame or fear of misunderstanding. And by a strange metamorphosis all his affection for Ethel and Jack went out for the time being to Reginald Clark. End of section 8